sing, Behold the King. Behold the King who conquered and overcame our sin. Behold our glorious victor whose mercy knows no end. He is true, he is right, death is broken, he is alive. God undefeatable, kingdom unshakable, in majesty and power you reign. Love undeniable, matchless in power. Yes, you can. Oh, oh, oh. Now our way is certain in Him. And now our way is certain. And our souls in you secure. Through every pain and struggle. Rejoice in this. Your victory. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, church. Yay, you said good morning back. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you here this Sunday. I'd also like to welcome those of you joining us by live stream. We would like to wish you a happy Mother's Day. To all the moms and to all the women who, all the women who make a difference in the lives of our children. Thank you to all of you and happy Mother's Day. We, yes, I agree. 
So this is the time that I'm supposed to remind you to let us know that you are here. Hopefully you picked up a handy dandy bulletin. You can fill this out. There's a spot for prayer requests on the back and you will be asked to put this in the offering plate later. You can also check in online at the u.org slash check in or on our app. And now I'd like to ask you to join me as we invite God to be with us here in this place. Father God, thank you for this beautiful morning, for the people gathered here in your house, for the privilege it is to worship you together. We ask that you meet us in this place, that you teach us, fill us, grant us the capacity to know you more and to leave here changed. In your holy name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite you to join us um, as we read responsively and continue our time in worship. The scripture will be on the screen. We're gonna read Psalm 71, 11 through 14. They say, pursue and seize that person whom God has forsaken, for there is no one to deliver. O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. Let my accusers be put to shame and consumed. Let those who seek to hurt me be covered with scorn and disgrace. But I will hope continually and praise you more. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charlotte. Let's stand up. And as you do, I want to invite you to squeeze towards the middle if you can. We've got some folks coming in uh, to worship with us. Let's sing this together. Your glory speaks. Your glory speaks in every language across the sky to every nation. You are beauty unimagined this is who you are you are the lord of my salvation you are the one who lights my way through the dark night you will This is who you are. This is who he is. This is who you are. So let's lift it up together. So let's lift it up, lift it up. Endless praises to our God. Full of grace, full of love. And he's reigning over us. I know you are faithful. Holy 
to Jesus.
God of how great you are and how much better it is to give ourselves to you and let you guide us and let you make decisions and let you light our path. So we surrender the things that we feel we own. We surrender the things that we think belong to us, including our lives and everything that's involved with that. And we just give them to you. We lay them down at your feet and we ask you to take those, make our lives meaningful. We thank you that by your love and your grace, you've already done that, but we just need to accept and to follow the things that you say. We thank you, God, um, for your love again for this morning, for all the blessings that you pour out upon us every single day. We give it back to you, Jesus, in this time. We pray all of these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Welcome, church. My name is Chelsea Aguilar, and I'm a children's ministry associate here at university. And I would like to ask all of our children to come down to the front for our children's moment. Hopefully, we have a box coming as well. Welcome. There are a lot of kids today. Uh-huh, that'll be great. I see a box. Can I have that? Okay, give everybody a moment to sit down. So Pastor Lorinda has two rules about the box. What's the first one? It can't be alive. What's the second rule? It's not don't break the box, but please don't break the box. It can't be stinky. Okay, so let's see what we have. Oh, wow. Here, let me take off my keys. We have a whale. Okay. We have a fish. And we have a little Lego man. Does the Lego man go with the whale and the fish for any reason? Are they just toys? You love them? Just toys. Oh, I was told if the Lego guy was a fisherman, then they would go together. So, has anyone ever been to SeaWorld? Can you raise your hand? Been to SeaWorld? Have you seen a whale or a fish there? Yeah. They also have people there that keep us safe. This little Lego man, if you can't see it, is a policeman. Kind of like a zookeeper. Yes, they do protect us from the animals escaping. So, you know, this reminds me of all of God's creatures. Do y'all love animals? Yeah. Yeah. And God put us on here to t- on earth to take care of his animals. Yeah. So this weekend, 
His helmet's right here. It fell off. This weekend, I actually went to a place called Orange Grove, Texas, and I got to see some of God's animals there. It wasn't a whale and it wasn't a fish, but my sister has four cows in her backyard. I know. So the way that God calls us to care for fishies and whales, he also calls us to care for cows and our dogs and our cats right? And while I was out there, boys and girls, boys and girls, while I was out there, Miss Mia, one of the cows was about to have a baby cow. And my niece, she said, Aunt Chelsea, even Miss Mia is a child. Even though she's a mommy, she's a child. Even though this fish might be a mommy or a daddy fish, they're still a child, And even though this whale might be a mommy or a daddy whale, they're still a child. And do you know why she told me that? She said, because we're all God's children. And I said, girlfriend, preach. Because when you get taught by a six-year-old that you're God's child, take a step back, okay? (laughs) And so even though we have mommies and daddies and aunts and uncles, they're also God's children too. So what's today? Today's a special day. Mother's Day, Mother's Day. And sometimes it's not just, boys, it's not just mommies who take care of us. It's a lot of people that take care of us and we're all children of God and we're all put on this earth to take care of God's animals and to take care of each other. So let's pray before we move on with our morning. We're gonna do an echo prayer. Are y'all ready? All right. Church, pray with us. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for all the animals of the earth and the moments that they teach us that we are also your children. Even mommies and daddies are your children. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, boys and girls, go back to your mommies and daddies. If you're in choir, please go back and sit with your choir teachers. Oh, who would like to take the box? I forgot. I'm going to give it to Miss Taylor. Oh, sorry. Taylor, are your parents going to be here next week? Where are your parents at? Y'all going to be here? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Chelsea. Y'all, let's give her a hand. That is, um, wow, it's a hard thing. And thank you, boys and girls, for coming forward. I failed to tell y'all earlier that my name is Sharla Bell, and I'm sorry for that. I'm Sharla, and I am on staff here at university. And each week, I have the amazing privilege of sitting down with someone from our congregation and talking with them about a way that the Lord is moving in and through their lives. I learn all kinds of things, but every week I'm reminded that our God is powerful and that he uses us to do his work on this earth. This week, if you'll look at the cover of your bulletin, I got to write a story about Leo and Mary Sue Adams. Now, Leo spent about 10 years of his childhood in an orphanage. And he would be the first to tell you that his story is not tragic. That in fact, he learned incredible things while there. And one of the things that he learned was about the importance of teaching children their dignity, that they have great self-worth. And so when he heard a few months back that there are children in the care of CPS, that when they get moved from home to home, They carry their belongings in trash bags. He just really wasn't okay with that, and he felt moved to action. And so the story this week is about the ways in which that experience as a child have informed the action that he's taken along with his Sunday school class believers and people um, elsewhere in the church, that they have formed this collection that hopefully you will participate in. But the story found at the u.org slash stories will tell you all about it. My hope is while you're there, 
you might go and read some other stories because what I hope you're encouraged to see is that our God is moving. The Spirit is moving amongst us, and I'm hope you're, I hope that you're encouraged to see the way in which God is moving in your own life. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward. I'd also like to call your attention to this prayer quilt to our my right, your left, um, for a young girl in our congregation, as well as the prayer cards to my left, your right, that you can sign and let someone know that you are thinking and praying about them. And if you would please join me in prayer. Father God, you are a good father. You love us so richly, and by your mercies, you bless us beyond what we deserve. We bring you only what is yours, creator God, that you might use this offering and the giver for the building up of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Father God, we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
have to unmute it. There it is. Oh, was that not awesome? Come on. I think we definitely have to clap for them because I haven't seen them since like I've been at this church. And so I definitely want to make sure they feel it so they can come back. Our children's choir is amazing. I used to sing that song when I was a kid, uh, the Hush song. And it's really cute and pretty and everything. It's better when they do it. I couldn't sing. So people were just telling me to hush. They didn't want to hear me <laughs> at all. Uh, for those I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Lo Alleman. I am the director of student ministries here at university. I'm also one of the preachers here and one of the many folks that's excited to have you all here uh, with us. I'm going to pray and we're going to get started with our message. That sound good? Sweet. Let's pray. Father, uh, we are your children and we have no desire to be alone, uh, no desire to be apart from you. We desire to be here um, with you, that you would be here with us. Uh, and that your spirit and your voice and your word would speak clearly over our lives. We pray for this time, this moment, um, the opening of your scripture would be uh, led by you, led by your spirit, that you would make us the kind of folks you would have us to be uh, in light of it. To your name, Jesus, that we all pray. Amen. So we have like a lot of content to get to and a whole bunch of stuff I want to share with you guys. But I kind of can't like skim over how special of a day it is. Uh, happy Mother's Day. To all the moms. Do you have any moms in the house? Okay. It's a very, that's fine. It's a very mom response. Oh, yes, I'm here. It's, yeah, thank you. It's, uh, yes, I'm, thank you. Uh, the flip should be a lot more um, animated. Anybody celebrating a mom today? <laughs> there we go. Much better. Significantly better. You got the eye from the mom. You better celebrate me. You better... <laughs> Make some noise up in here. Uh, I don't know if y'all know this, but before I came to this church, I actually was a spoken word poet and speaker, so I traveled around a bit. Uh, and a couple of years back, I had a church that commissioned me to write a poem for Mother's Day, uh, which was super fun. Whenever I do get commissioned to do something like that, I can like do some studying or some research or interview some folks to kind of prep for uh, the poem. And years back, I had a chance to interview several moms to get ready for this poem uh, and several folks that had moms. And it was pretty interesting. I learned a lot. Like a whole lot. One, I found that everybody thinks they have the best mom. You notice that? Like everybody thinks their mom is better than everybody else's mom. Everybody thinks their mom can cook better than everybody else's mom, which is not always true, but whatever, teach his own. Um, I've learned that people are really defensive over their moms. Like I've seen many of fights get started because of your mama joke went the wrong way. And so be careful with that. Uh, I've, I've talked to folks who had lost their moms and the kind of hole that that leaves in them. Uh, that the moms play a very big role in our lives. Fun thing I had a chance to do is interview my own mom. Uh, which is interesting. My mom, I, I, I'm one of the folks that think I have the best mom ever. I uh, was raised by a single mom. She's fantastic. But my mom is crazy. Like, she's a great mom. Like, the best there is. But my mom's kind of crazy. My mom's kind of mom that if she calls you at, like, 10.01, you better answer at 10 o'clock. You know what I mean? Like, she's one of those kind of moms. Uh, when I was, uh, started speaking and traveling and stuff, uh, my mom would, like, hold my schedule, and she would, like, call me to make sure I was where I was supposed to be on time. Like, I thought I was an adult, but she said not yet. And so it's like one of those kind of moms. Uh, mom was fantastic. I asked her her perspective on being a mom, and the, the most profound thing she said to me uh, was that as much as we consider that we are shaped by our mothers and we are uh, transformed by them, she believed that motherhood actually transformed her. Uh, that she became a different kind of person, a different version of herself with every kid that she has. When she had me, she had to learn new ways to be patient. She had one of my sisters. She had to learn new ways to be encouraging, new ways to be loving. Uh, she had to learn new ways to be herself. But she found that she had more depths for compassion and love and forgiveness than she ever thought she had. And so motherhood, as much as it shapes us, like I'm not sure if you know this, but 100% of the human beings living today have a human mom. Uh, it's, a, it's a stat. You can check it. Uh, the truth is not, like, the same for dads. Like, Jesus kind of messed that whole thing up. But other than him, like, we all, our parents shape us, but motherhood also shapes them. And so when we thank you for being moms, we thank you not only for being awesome and cool to us, uh, but we thank you for being willing to be transformed, to be made into something different, which is uh, literally we have no world without you. So thank you uh, for all that you do. Uh, other perspective I got from moms is kind of like, uh, all around the board, every mom I interviewed said that what they thought about motherhood going into it was totally different than what motherhood actually is. Like there's an expectation, there's a perception, and then there's the reality of a thing. I'm a, I'm a meme kind of guy, so I found a couple of memes kind of explain this. So there's a perception of what it looked like to like snuggle with your kid, and then there's the reality of it. It's like a lot of burying their face into you and throwing up hot stuff on your body. I think like new age moms have to like find stuff that matches with like peas and stuff. You think it's going to be cute to lay with your kid. And the reality is you get a foot in the face. 
Uh, and media doesn't help. Like our, our world pushes a message. Like so you think a toddler's one way. And in reality, having a kid, it's a little bit different. Uh, I think this is true not only for moms, like there's a perception that we think of what it's like, and it's very different in reality. I think this is also ridiculously true for our apprenticeship to Jesus, uh, especially when it comes to us following after the Spirit of God. Uh, There's an idea, there's a perception of what we think God is for, what we think God is wanting to do in our world, and what it's like to hang out with Him. Uh, Then we open up Scripture, and we find that encounters with the Spirit are actually very different. I'm not sure what your church background was. Uh, I grew up in a predominantly African-American church. Well, I say predominantly, it was all black folks. It's pretty much all black church. (laughs) So I grew up in this black church, and for me, when I heard about the Spirit, my understanding, my perception of the Spirit was that the Spirit is what made the service fun. It's what made church more lively. It's what made the folks sing. Not sing, but they sang whenever the Spirit came. It's what made things better, more fun, more, more interactive. That's what I thought the Spirit was for. And what we've been doing in this last couple of weeks, we've been opening up the Bible and having this series called Encounters with the Spirit. We've been looking and seeing that the Spirit's focus and His job has so much more to do than just what happens in our church service. Like the Spirit's role in our lives is significantly more robust, significantly more essential to our lives and the kind of people that God has us to be. The role of the Spirit, quite like motherhood, is to transform us into a different kind of people. It's to make us alive the way that God defines life. We've seen how in the beginning God's Spirit was hovering over the waters of creation, making a world out of nothing. We see how the Spirit in Genesis 2 puts life in our nostrils and makes us become living people. So the Spirit is actually the same word for breath, not just alive and around us somewhere, but actually in us. Every moment of our lives, we inhale and exhale moments that God gives us. The Spirit of God is what makes us alive. And so we find that the Spirit is with us not just in like the most amazing high moments of our lives. Like with Joel, he prophesies that the Spirit of God is going to be in everyone and people will dream dreams and have visions. and Everyone will become alive and vibrant in God's presence. And he's in those mountaintop moments. But we also read in Job that the Spirit is also in Job in the very difficult times of his life. And in, in, in the valleys as well, so from the ups and the downs, the mountains, the valleys, the Spirit is what is in us that sustains us, that keeps us going, that enlivens us and makes us alive in him. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at another encounter with the Spirit uh, from like the MVP of Scripture. We're actually going to look at the story of Jesus in Mark chapter 1. Uh, we'll have the verses up on the screen. I also encourage you to like, open up your Bibles. Uh, heads up, when I teach, I like, I'll be all over the place. And so I know some folks like to stand up when they're, like, they're reading the Scripture. And I just want to warn you, you will be standing for a long time. And so if you want to stand, you're more than welcome to uh, get the little exercise in. But we'll be in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. Uh, I'll be reading from NIV. We'll also have it on the screens for you. And this is what the story reads. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. If you guys remember, uh, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And Mark tells us a few verses before here that John the Baptist had begun a pretty popular ministry. Uh, A couple verses before this moment happens, uh, Mark says that John had been preaching a message of repentance and the coming of the kingdom. And everybody from the countryside of Judea and many of the folks in Jerusalem came out to go see John. And so John's ministry is really popular and it's booming and he's Jesus' cousin. And so you would expect, you know, Jesus could be like, hey, John. Slot me some of your followers, you know, co-sign for me in this whole ministry thing and get my ministry kind of taken off. And if you remember, John tries to do that. He's like, this guy that's coming after me is super cool and he's dope and I can't even tie his sandals. He's a really great guy and he should be baptizing me. I shouldn't baptize him. And so John kind of tries to co-sign for Jesus. But in the story, Jesus does something interesting. He submits himself to John's baptism. So we see Jesus take on, like this is God in flesh. Like, like, and John knows that, but Jesus is also the son of man. He humbles himself here in the story to be baptized by John's baptism, which seems really strange. It's a peculiar scene until you see what happens next in verse 10. So in verse 10, Jesus gets baptized. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased. You are my beloved. You are my son who I am very well pleased with. Uh, This verse 
is what we consider like the watershed moment in Jesus' ministry. It's what kind of catapults him into doing ministry publicly uh, for the world to see. Uh, This story is found in the Gospel of Mark. Mark in the New Testament is sandwiched between the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, and those are considered the synoptic Gospels. They're all different perspectives of the same exact events. And so we have all these different perspectives and different accounts of what what was happening in the same moments, and they all kind of have a telling of a story a little bit differently, but they're all pointing to the same exact truth, that this is the moment where Jesus catapulted into ministry and whether they think that the spirit descends like a physical dove or just like a dove and the gentleness and the peacefulness of it, the point is, here is Jesus being approved by the Father, saying he's loved by him, being filled with the spirit. That gets the point. And all of this is done, worth noting, before he just does anything. Like he doesn't have to earn it or prove it. He doesn't have to go out and like heal the sick and cast out demons and preach sermons. All of that will come. But he is approved by the Father well before he does anything before he puts any effort towards it at all. He's simply loved by God. That's his identity. That's his core. And we know that this will get called into question later, but before anything happens in Jesus' story, before he moves into the world and does his ministry, he is found in the Father. He is approved by the Spirit and made alive by it. And this is a beautiful scene. Again, we don't know if the Spirit is like a physical dove, like a bird coming down on him, or if it's just like the gentleness that's being presented there. But the whole point is, this is a peaceful, harmonious, beautiful scene. So where we get the picture of the triune God all together. It's the Spirit, it's the Son, it's the Father, and they're all interacting in this harmonious dance. It's a beautiful scene that the Spirit orchestrates. This is awesome. It's pretty cool. Mark is really intentional with the language he uses so far. We, we get what's happening here. But I want you to know how quickly this moment gets brought to an abrupt end. So we pick back up in verse 12. What are the first two words there in verse 12? At once. Uh, That can also be translated as immediately. And that's like Mark's favorite word in the gospel. Uh, And in all the gospel of Mark, he uses that word at once or immediately. It's the rushed, urgent message of the gospel. Uh, And in chapter one, he uses at once or immediately up to seven times. Uh, And so he's, he's putting this language of like urgency on the backdrop of what happens here. Peaceful, beautiful moment. And Jesus gets jutted right out of it. At once, the Spirit sent him. Another translation reads, drove him. It's the same word for when Jesus would cast out a demon. He is drove out of this moment. At once, the Spirit sent him or drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. This is the reading of the Word of God for the people of God. A question mark on that. Like, thanks be to God. (laughs) Thankful that Jesus was tempted by the devil and driven out of a really peaceful moment. Uh, that language that's being used there is that, that urgency, that immediacy, Jesus being drove out of this moment, is on the backdrop of a beautiful scene that just gets crashed, like it just comes crashing down. Before we go on, has this ever happened to anybody? Like, has this, has this been your story? Like, you're having a beautiful day, the birds are chirping, the sun is out, there's no traffic on 1604, you are having an awesome day, the kids are behaving, you got a promotion at your job, you're eating downtown, you're eating in the Pearl, you're hanging out in the Pearl, and you're eating a steak at Southerly. If you've not been to Southerly, go there and see if the Lord is at work in our city. It's an amazing day for you, it's all going great, and then suddenly, it all turns to crap. Like something happens, Someone has like a car accident, or your car breaks down, or kids get sick, and then things just go crazy and haywire. You don't know who to blame. Is it the kids? Is it the traffic? Is it, the, is it your spouse? Never blame your spouse. It's never your spouse's fault. But you're trying to figure out what's happened to where this beautiful, awesome, peaceful day just got turned upside down. This is the story. And whereas we look for folks to blame, Mark makes it very clear who's to blame for this moment. The Spirit orchestrates this beautiful, harmonious scene, but it's that same exact Spirit that ruins it. Notice what happens. Like, don't miss it. The Spirit makes this awesome moment, this awesome encounter, arranging this harmonious scene with, between Jesus, the Son, and the Father, and the Spirit. It's all beautiful, but then the Spirit is what drives Jesus out of it, what gets him away from it. And we have a bunch of questions about this. My main one is why, for what? And Mark makes it very clear. Jesus leaves this moment to go into direct conflict and direct confrontation with Satan. He leaves the harmony and the peace of being in comfort with the Father and goes to do battle with evil face to face. That the Spirit's job in our lives is to create peace, but also conflict. To create a moment where we are out, where we're face to face with God and things are good, but we also come face to face with evil and challenge. Uh, Mark 
kind of rushes through this story. Uh, but in the other gospels, the synoptic gospels, they kind of point to how big of a deal this is. And this interaction between Jesus and Satan is very, very interesting. Uh, Satan calls into question Jesus' identity, his purpose. There's a weird Bible quiz bowl thing that happens. They exchange scriptures and stuff like that. Uh, but basically the whole purpose of his methods is, is, is this one end. It's to get Jesus to forsake his mission on earth, which is to restore and redeem our broken world. And so what he's trying to do is to derail Jesus from that end to not restore us, to not redeem us. And notice how he tempts him. Jesus leaves the place of comfort, and Satan tempts him by trying to get him to go back to it. Hey, if you're hungry, just feed yourself. Uh, Hey, if you want to be worshipped, just worship me. The tempting that that Satan offers Jesus is, you just left the place of comfort. Here's a quick way to get back to it. You see that? He's inviting him to go back to the kind of comfort that the Spirit already offered. But the Spirit will have nothing of it. The Spirit leads him into direct confrontation with Satan to go toe-to-toe with evil on purpose. And though Mark rushes through the story, he gives us some intentional language here. He tells us where it happens. So Jesus is out in the wilderness amongst the wild animals. He tells us how. He's there for 40 days, which kind of represents the, 40, uh, the number for, for Israel, how they're wandering in the wilderness. Uh, but he also tells us why. That, that Satan didn't just sneak up on Jesus but that blatantly, here in the story, Jesus sought him out, which I think reveals something really intentional and beautiful and awesome about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is all about peace, but God's definition for peace is totally different from ours. In the Old Testament, the word they use for peace is shalom, and it doesn't just mean like I'm having a happy day or I have good feelings, but it means a universal wellness, that everything in the world is well. And when seeking shalom, Based upon their definition of it, things cannot be universally well here if I know brokenness is just around the corner. Things cannot be okay with me if I know that there's oppression or discrimination or hatred or injustice happening around the corner. I cannot be in shalom. I cannot be in a state of peace if I know brokenness is just around the bend. And so what the Spirit does is he is the character of God and moves Jesus into conflict where that brokenness is. So that the peace that Jesus has can go and be spread because he is on the move and leading Jesus to do things and to be in conflict with the enemy. Uh, the story we see in the bulletin, I think, captures really, really well. I haven't had a chance to meet uh, the Adams family. But I hear this story and I think, man, you have a person who was living in a situation that could have been bad but wasn't. Uh, Mr. Leo was in an orphanage, and the stereotype behind orphanages, aren't, they aren't that great. Uh, but his experience was actually great. Uh, the Lord placed people in his life to give him a sense of dignity, a sense of, of worthwhile, to make him a person that he knew he had value. And then he moves out of this place and finds that there are folks in similar situations that don't have it as well. And the goodness and the beauty that God placed inside of his life, he sees it's not there for other kids. And there's something about him that's just like, I can't stand it. I can't be okay with it. If what God has done in my life can be done for them also, I have a spiritual unrest until it happens there. Shalom means that God's wellness is here in me, but I work towards the end of it being here in you as well. No matter what you look like, no matter what the situation is for you, if God's placed his spirit inside of me, it will be peace. But the spirit will also lead me to be in confrontation so that his peace can be made abundant in others as well. And this is a story that we see in, all throughout Scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul kind of gives this language uh, in 2 Corinthians verse 17 and 18. Uh, he says, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I have been made free by the Spirit of God who is alive inside of me. And we all, he goes on in verse 18, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Paul says, like, the Spirit of the Lord has granted me freedom. I am now free and alive in him. But as I pursue the Spirit, as I see him with unveiled face, I become transformed to not just be a person who receives peace. I don't just receive freedom, but I become an agent of freedom in our world. Like, I am transformed not just by the Spirit of God living in me, but he does things through me, leads me to conflict, leads me to places where there is brokenness. God's shalom being made alive in me leads me to want to be made alive in the rest of our world. And this is an ongoing motif all throughout Scripture. Think of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, when God's Spirit is hovering over the waters, we tend to think about peaceful waters. Uh, but the Hebrew term there for what the waters were like is tohu vabohu. It means chaotic and disoriented. And so God's Spirit is over a chaotic, crazy mess of a world. And so what does God do? 
Does he say, here's chaos, here's craziness, I'm going to be dis, you know what would be better? I'm going to make a world over here and leave that craziness alone. No, he goes straight to it, hovers over it. His spirit hovers over the crazy, hovers over the chaos that he might bring it to order. This is two. Uh, when we are made into being bodies, but we're lifeless, in a lifeless mess that we are, nothing but dust, what does God do? Does he say, they're dirty and there's no life in them. I'll go find some other folks. No. The Spirit of God comes and fills us with his breath of life. And we're made alive. Where there was lifelessness, God comes puts life there. Where there's chaos, God comes and brings order. Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones, and there's nothing but death and decay. God's spirit does not say, let me avoid it, but comes directly to it, which is confrontation. Leads himself into conflict with death and dying and says, it will not be so here. That's the message of the Holy Spirit, that where it is brokenness and emptiness, his spirit comes. What we see in Jesus is that God's spirit has made a peaceful moment, which is awesome, but he can't stay in it. Like, it's good. It's great. The Spirit of God gives us moments where we are alive and have much to celebrate and much joy. I know this to be true for all of us. But he is led outside of that to make peace multiply. I think this is true for the Adams family and what they do with duffel bags. But I think this is also true for all of us. I believe there's something in every last one of us that keeps us up at night, makes it hard to go to bed. Sometimes it's what gets us up out in the morning, but there's something that we're just unsettled about. That the Spirit gives us unrest. And oftentimes we want to blame the enemy or our world. But actually, I think it's the Spirit of God that stirs in us and leads us like it led Jesus. That says, this thing is not okay by me. Go do something about it. I have placed life and worth and value inside of you. And it's not here. The way I want to go and bring it is by sending you. By compelling us to say things are not okay where they're broken. So God leads us to the brokenness. Uh, anybody a Chronicles of Narnia fan at all? Read the books? Know, know what it is? Thank you so much. Awesome. So uh, the Chronicles of Narnia is written by a guy named C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite writers. Uh, and there's a, there's a scene in one of the, one of the books uh, where he's talking. Uh, there's this lady named Susan. Uh, and Susan's having a conversation with Mr. Beaver. And she's about to meet Aslan. And she's kind of nervous about it. She's like, it's a, it's a big freaking lion. And so I want to make sure that things are okay before I meet Aslan. And so she asks Mr. Beaver, hey, is, is, is Aslan safe? Like, is the lion I'm about to meet safe? And his response to me is super profound. This is what he responds. He says, safe? Who says anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. Of course it isn't safe. But he's really good. I think that the life that Jesus invites his disciples to is not a terribly safe one. He actually made it really clear to them. He said, hey, if they persecute me, you can expect they'll persecute you also. Hey, if they're uncomfortable with the things that I teach and you teach them also, they'll be pretty uncomfortable with it. I think if we have this expectation that because we are followers of Jesus, everything will be peaceful and good, gives us a false expectation of what we can expect. The reality is is that if they did not like the things that Jesus was saying, it'll lead us into confrontation with people. If, if If we're not okay with brokenness and brokenness is the status quo, then when we speak out on it and we try to change it, that will lead us into conflict. And it's not a terribly safe situation, but it's good. It's really worthwhile. Whether it's you're giving someone a duffel bag, whether it's you're you're taking somebody into your home, uh, Jesus goes as far as to say, if anybody gives one of these little people a cup of water, they will not be forgotten. Whatever the Spirit prompts you to do in response to the brokenness, after he has made you alive, whatever happens next is the kingdom of God advancing. Whatever happens next is God's Spirit moving in our world and us responding to it. And it may not be safe, but it is so good. When I was a kid, I was like 17 years old, I played football, and I was like a soldier, big old muscular thug kid, and I played ball, and I was raised by getting my mom, and uh, I had, uh, playing football, I broke my hip, broke my hip, shattered my pelvis, I'm not sure if you ever broke a hip before, but it's the suckiest feeling ever in the history of life. So I broke my hip, and there's not much you can do when you break your hip, and so I'm this big, swole, can't-do-nothing kid. And my mom, like, had to take care of me. In a way that she'd taken care of me before, but as an adult, I've never like felt it. As a 17-year-old, never felt it. So I couldn't take a shower myself. So my mom had to bathe me. I couldn't use the bathroom myself, so my mom had to help me use the bathroom. I couldn't put myself in the bed, so my mom had to tuck me in at night. Which is not stuff she hadn't done before. I just didn't know she did that. Like she did all of a sudden when I was a baby. Like, I, that, I knew that love was kind of there, but it wasn't until that moment of like difficulty, or that moment of discord, that moment of conflict, it wasn't really great, but I was able to see the kind of love that my mom had for me. 
And I think that same thing is true with the Spirit of God. When he leads us into these difficult moments, we get to see moments where God is showing that he's actively at battle and actively at odds with things that are not okay in our world. And when the, the window opens and we see it for ourselves, we're like, man, God has been fighting oppression all this time. God has been fighting discrimination all this time. God has been fighting injustice all this time. And now he's allowing me to partner with him, not just as someone who receives freedom, but an agent of freedom. Not just someone who receives peace, but a bringer of peace. When I get to partner with God in that, it transforms my perspective of myself and my perspective of him and my perspective of this world. What the Spirit calls us to is anything but comfort. Anything but being okay with what's not okay. The Spirit leads us to peace and to bring peace. In Genesis 2, what God makes really clear is like after he makes us alive, he puts us to work. Like the moment after we're made alive, he puts his breath in us not just to be cute, but to go do something. And when he does that, he says, hey, I want you to tend and keep this garden. There's work to be done here. I don't think that we, as we follow behind the Spirit of God, like it's really difficult to tend and keep the garden if we beat around the bush and always avoid the conflict. If we never come face to face when it's difficult, there are moments, there are things that God has placed inside of you that says, this is really good. And there are things that God has placed inside of you that says, this is not okay. And what he's inviting us to do is to say, not on our watch, that if the spirit of God is making us alive, we should not avoid the confrontation the spirit leads us to. But if it's for God, if God is for us, who can be against? If we're for God, then we have to be doing something. Have to be responding to what the spirit is calling us to do. In a moment, the band's going to come back out here, and they're going to we're going to sing some songs. We're going to praise our God for the goodness of what he, what he is and what he's done for our lives. We're going to sing a song that says we will respond wherever he calls us. Like that's, that's the words we're about to sing. But as we sing those, I, I pray that you would wrestle with that truth, that as he calls us out upon the water, are we actually going to follow the thing that keeps you up at night, the thing that God is stirring in you and letting the Spirit not give you rest on? Whatever that is, there's a way that we respond to that. If your physical response is tying a knot in our prayer quilts or signing one of our cards, if your physical response is, is going from this place and making amends with someone, or if it's joining us in, 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 this, in this duffel bag campaign, whatever it is that God is leading you to respond to, pray you see that this is an encounter with the Spirit, that God's Spirit is bringing peace into our world, not just to you, but through you. So he did for Jesus, and I believe that's what he invites himself to do for us as well. Let's pray. Father, our, our, our hope, our heart is that you would continue to stir in us what you would want to stir in us. I pray that you would continue to transform us into being your people. I pray that as we sing uh, these words to you, I pray that as we respond to you with our voices, that we would also uh, and more intentionally respond to you with our hearts, that you would know that we are your people, and that we would know that you are our God, and in light of that, beautiful relationship, we would have the peace of your spirit and be compelled by your spirit to bring peace into our world. Our prayer, Lord, is that you would be with us in this moment of worship, that you would be with us in this time of celebration. Our prayer is that you would be with us as we leave this place. We love you and we are so, Father, we are so thankful for your love. It is your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and continue our time of worship together.
Uh, I think there is a number of ways that the Spirit is leading us to uh, and inviting us to follow after Him and to respond. Uh, there's about three invitations our church has uh, for you here in the moment. Uh, one is if you have a desire to partner with us in uh, the duffel bag drive um, this Sunday, which is the 13th, uh, this Wednesday, 16th, and then the 20th on Sunday, uh, we will be uh, collecting duffel bags and items to put inside of them. Uh, if you were interested to know, it's about 600 kids are in CPS a year, are you put in CPS a year uh, here in San Antonio. Uh, and those kids have to move sometimes about 12 times. Um, and so just there is definitely a need. Uh, and I'm so thankful for those who have uh, spearheaded this and have taken this on. But this is not just a, a collaboration of one or two people in our church. This is something our entire church is invited to be a part of. And so if you want more information about that, uh, you can get more information on our welcome desk as you walk out. Uh, or find somebody on staff or anybody else who's involved in it. Like, please come and, and partner with us in this. Uh, also, next Sunday, I think we have a bulletin for this thing. Uh, next Sunday, we have a website information day. If you have any questions about how to finagle this weird website thing that we have going on, uh, how to sign up for events, how to give online, we'll have a class uh, next week uh, over between the Narthex and the Atrium. It's all called our Connections Room. Uh, it's that mythical building over there across from the bridge. So if you go over there for next Sunday, we'll have a class to show you how to do all that stuff. We'll actually have computers right there to register for your events and stuff like that. And so that's happening next Sunday. Uh, last invitation is go love somebody. Go say, hey, we didn't do like the whole meet you folks and say, how's your mama in here earlier? And so make sure you do that before you leave out of here. We love you. Uh, blessings, family. Amen. spoke a word you were singing all